Aloha. Welcome back to Politics in Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii with Dennis Esaki. Today we'll be speaking with Derek Kawakami, former Kauai County Councilman, State Legislator, now the Kauai County Mayor. The Kauai uh, Kawakami family has made their mark in public service and in the business community on Kauai and in the state. Derek is the mayor in this trying time to balance the business economy, safety, and community relations. I remember when Derek first ran for a seat on the KRUC board in an island-wide election. It was a forum, forum and Derek was asked a question. Of course, most of us didn't know much about the industry and he gave his answer and later someone else gave a different detailed commentary. I recall that Derek said he listened and he changed his mind and agreed. I think that being it, Listener is one of his good traits. Eric, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. And can you start by telling us about your entry into elective office and KAC? Thank you, Sensei. And if people are wondering why I call it Dennis Isaki Sensei, it's because <laughs> um, my entry into politics, one of the big stepping stones was getting elected to the KIUC Board of Directors. And um, at the time, Dennis was our board chairman, and um, here I was coming in um, very young, fresh, naive, and um, really unprepared, uh, not knowing even how to participate in these very formal meetings with Robert's rules. Luckily, we had a parliamentarian, Phil Takpeyan, on board, but um, I was surrounded by a group of professionals um, that were all well seasoned, that was excited about uh, embracing a young person interested in participating. And, and Dennis was um, one of the folks that took me under his wing. And it's funny you remember that forum uh, <laughs> because me uh, getting into that election was really um, sort of uh, being pushed by Senator Inouye and his camp. You know, in 2004, uh, Senator Inouye had a concern that there wasn't young uh, voices that were emerging to be a part of um, government, part of our civic duty. And so he, he recruited me to get involved. And then we got involved to run this campaign here on Kauai with Lenny Raposo. And uh, when we were done with the campaign, they said, okay, now it's your turn. And I really didn't have an interest. Um, but I sort of said, well, if I run for KIUC, will you folks leave me alone? And they said, just run for something. So I said, okay, here's something where I think I might be interested in, um, especially since we were right at that crossroads of making a determination on whether we wanted to be married to fossil fuels or if we wanted to move towards the direction of uh, self sustainability and renewable energy. So I said, th this is something that really um, interests me. And, and that was that was the first step. And I, I'm very thankful to the board. I'm very thankful to Dennis for for helping to, to get me involved. Yeah. Yeah, I remember you were head of the committee and uh, getting us uh, into renewable. Remember that? Yeah, that was the yeah, that was crazy, too. Um, they put me in charge of the strategic planning committee and um and they were just about ready to to take a look at their strategic plan and update it and um so here they are giving giving me a opportunity to to chair this committee and be a part of setting the direction that KIUC was going to move towards and um you know at the time we had set some lofty goals, but let me tell you, right, um, Dennis, you know, and I know that just amongst the KIEC framework of their existing employees, we had some very forward thinking individuals, you know, people like Brad Rockwell, who was the engineer who pulled us up on the side and said, hey, you should set the renewable energy goal higher, just set it higher and have us, make us, make us work to get to that goal. And so we, we set it high. And um, I have to say, uh, I'm very um, honored and blessed that KRUC is, is leading the way, not only um, you know, in the state, but also nationally, as far as uh, being forward thinking and, and deploying renewable energy. 
into our portfolio. Yeah, I think we were ahead of our time, and uh, we and in the uh, framework we talked about coal, and you, I remember you and I said, no, no way, we're not going into coal. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad that you spoke up, right? Because at the time, coal was very appealing. When you took a look at like what the uh, the diesel and NAFTA prices were when we were talking about, hey, you know, we're investing more in renewable energy. And then the pitch was, well, you need some sort of firm power to make sure that the intermittent, you know, characteristics of some of this renewable energy that we're bringing online, um, you know, at the time, coal was, was something that was looked at. And, um, you know, we just said, no, we don't want to invest our Keiki's future into something that we don't feel is going to be the best thing for them uh, long term and something that doesn't fit into our culture and, and the direction that we're moving in. So fortunately, you know, Dennis, you had the, the foresight to be able to say, yeah, not, not on our watch. So very good. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, the county and the state. Uh, you worked on uh, legislative branch in the county as well as the state. Can you... Give us a comparison. Gosh, what can I say? You know, uh, being on the council and going to the state legislatures, like, you know, drinking water through a fire hose when you think about how much you learn in, in the overall structure of government and governance. Um, you get a good experience as to how the different departments all work, uh, what doesn't work, but you also get to see. Uh, policy making at, at a larger on a larger stage, being one of 51 representatives, um, and then having a body like a you know 25 member Senate, you know, and a governor to to work with, as well as the various county councils, and then of course at the time, you know, our mayor Mayor Carvalho. Uh, for me, it it was a good, um, it was a good experience, um, but I don't think it's something that I would that I would do again. Um, and that's not to say um, that I didn't gain a lot from it or we weren't able to do a lot of good things. We were able to do a lot of great things during that time at the legislature. Um, you know, at that time we were able to help, um, you know, Koi recover um, from another weather event that had washed away a part of our highway. Uh, we'd been able to build a library for the elementary school and a number of other uh, big investments. but. You know, coming from a neighbor island and having a young family, it's extremely, um, it's extremely taxing on the family life to to have to um, be at work on Oahu um, while your daughter and son is in school and your wife is at home taking care of the whole family on her own. Uh, but um, it, it, everything happens for a reason. Uh, being on the county council is great to um, see how that process works, but. I would be lying if I didn't say that the best job I've ever had is as mayor. I, I would do it a million times over. And um, even though at times I feel like um, COVID-19 has um, put a little speed bump in, in, you know, in our priorities, um, for this community, I think it's easy to say that I'm glad it's me. Um, and I feel honored to be a mayor during a big challenge. And um, I do a, I'll do it a million times over. I really love this job. There's, there's something about being able to to see change happen, um, being able to work with um, people uh, close to home, and being able to go home to my family and um, do all the things that I love. You know, hunting, surfing. Um, before COVID nineteen, we were playing softball and just doing you know all the things that you know that you know we do on Kauai. It's, I got the best of, yeah. I mean, what more could I ask for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Paul, uh, you too. Um, I remember you were at the right place at the right time when the opening came up in the uh, legislature. And uh, I guess it was Neil Governor Abercrombie appointed you. Whose place was that? Uh, that was, uh, that was um, former rep, uh, Mina Marita. She went to go on and chair the PUC. And Governor Abercrombie called me on April Fool's Day yeah. to tell me that he was going to appoint me, and I had to. I felt bad because I was. I thought it was an April Fool's joke, so I may have. 
not been so diplomatic to, to him, not knowing that he was serious about it. No, 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 we, we, we all yeah. wanted to. But, um, I remember uh, when we were talking star with uh, Mayor Jeremy Harris, you asked him uh, what is his greatest accomplishment? What do you think are your, your greatest accomplishments? I don't feel like, um, I mean, I don't really, um, I don't really feel like I've accomplished anything what you would consider great. Um, but uh, I, I think what really drives me uh, more than the, than the big accomplishments, which I think, you know, considering the, the footsteps I got to follow in um, with all the former mayors um, and not even having completed my first term, I, I, I'm really driven by just the, the, what people would just um, oftentimes overlook. Um, and, and that's being able to sort of start changing the culture of this organization, um, starting to formulate a team and having um, a, a training program formalized to be able to get our workers um, mobilized up the, up the ladder so that they have an opportunity to move up into supervisory roles, to give our managers and supervisors the tools that they need to effectively lead and to, to in a sense, take an organization, analyze where we were strong, take a look at where our weaknesses are and start to build upon them and, and continue to improve. Changing the process of the motor vehicle registration where we decentralize our operations so that people down in Princeville and Hanalei can renew their registration at Foodland Princeville, bringing a kiosk down to Ishihara Market in the west side and um, being able to do, I think, things that most people don't notice um, right off the bat are, are things that really drive me, the, the details of the operation that can be boring, but it, I tell you, the little details um, are what add up to what could be great one day, but I think I am far away from achieving anything great, and I just got to continue to work hard because I think every leader and every person strives to achieve some level of, um, of work where, you know, the people are going to recognize it and appreciate it. But, you know, what drives me is the, the little victories and um, just cheering people up. You know, if, if we see somebody that needs help and we're able to help them or connect them to a service, that, that's what really gets me up every day. And then, of course, if I'm, if, you know, if my good dad and my good husband, I think that's the greatest accomplishment I could ask for. Thank you. Yeah, sometimes the simple things are the greatest. Um, however, in some of the departments, we have uh, challenges. It's been around for a long time. Yeah. Look at the landfill, the solid waste, and sewer. Um, then we got to find a, a site for the, for the landfill. Oh, gosh. What, what, a, what a big, big... Um... Asking yes, it. I mean, I, it's, it's hard. I mean, and that's where we're trying to change the way that we handle solid waste, right? I mean, landfills in and of itself are a very archaic way of handling solid waste, especially on an island. And I really think that we have made strides towards um, taking a, a look at holistically how we manage our existence on on this island and being able to coexist with the environment but i will tell you you know it, just to show how challenging it is you know the prior administration had 10 years to to site a new landfill knowing that you know the end of our lifespan at kika was running out and um you know they ran into roadblock after roadblock um, and, you know, the, the latest site that we're looking at um, on Mahalo Road uh, has some serious concerns being drawn up by the Department of Transportation and, and the landowners, which is, of course, um, the state of Hawaii, on whether or not they're going to let us utilize that, that site. So as we run out of time um, and as we undergo, undergo our integrated solid waste management plan, we're taking a look at what we've learned uh, that works and doesn't work and making sure that we're able to execute a plan and get things in place. So whomever it is as the next mayor, uh, I don't want them to worry about where the next landfill is going to be or what their solid waste program is going to look like. 
And as far as our aging infrastructure, you know, our top priorities coming in were very simple. It roads infrastructure, addressing deferred maintenance that hadn't been, you know, paid attention to and, and park conditions. And of course, you know, as we move along, that all leads up to housing opportunities and of course, driving our economy as well. So keep it simple. Yeah, I mean, you got a big task. Um, even on Oahu, they had the similar problem on uh, landfill with the Waimanalo Gulch. Took them years and years. I think they even expired the permits and finally they got it. Uh, sewer, you know, we got uh, a lot of them on individual wastewater systems over here as opposed to sewer systems. We got uh, a lot of other. Uh, Good thing we don't have as many water line breaks as Oahu. They got some big infrastructure problems over there too. But uh, we gotta keep at it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that, that, I think every mayor coming in has yeah. has to understand that our primary focus is to um, to address aging infrastructure because I don't think it's gonna be one administration that's gonna fix it. Um, infrastructure, like any facility, requires ongoing maintenance. And the minute that you start deferring that maintenance to um, take a look at shifting towards other priorities, these things have a way of rearing its ugly head uh, down the line where it becomes much more expensive. And this is not just a Koi problem. This is a, a, a national problem that's being recognized by the federal government. That's why a bulk of their federal highway monies is just going to repair and maintenance of the existing infrastructure. And there are very few resources for building new infrastructure and new roads. And, and that's a good thing because like anything else, you have to take care of what you have um, and make sure you can take care of it well before you start adding on to our inventory of responsibilities. And that's really what we're focused on is just getting things up to par and uh, making sure that the, you know, the lights turn on, the water flows, you flush your toilet and it goes away. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I don't wanna to spend too much time on COVID. Um, it's here on day every morning. Anyway, um, even before COVID, there, there are talks about reducing tourism. Uh, what do you say about, you know, reduced tourism? I don't think it was reducing tourism. I think it was one understanding what our carrying capacity is and having it managed in the way that there was a, a, a equilibrium or a balance that could be maintained between um, having that sector of our economy, which by the way, is the driving force of our economy and not having it erode too much into our quality of life as far as the traffic issues that we have competing interests with um, different forms of visitor accommodations uh, like vacation rentals and its impact on our housing inventory and our ability to get our local men and women into housing so that they don't have to move away to the mainland. And um, that's still something that we are seeking to achieve. I will tell you that, um, you know, Kauai oftentimes doesn't get the credit, um, but we like it that way. Right, we keep our head down and we just continue to, you know, plow away and uh, get work done. But you know, our our planning department was light years ahead as far as regulating the vacation rental industry. We were the first county to effectively regulate vacation rentals outside of the visitor destination area. Um, coming in as mayor, we were able to come to an agreement with Airbnb and VRBO that they were only going to market bona fide accommodations that had a use certificate to operate in the county of Kauai versus just allowing anybody to put their property onto the market. Um, and we were able to um, take a look at uh, raising revenue off the visitor industry to make much needed improvements. Now, moving forward, I think what happens is a lot of people now understand the impact of the visitor industry and our quality of life because what COVID-19 did was basically slow the visitor industry down to a trickle and many people started to realize that hey the traffic evaporated overnight 
um, our ability to get to our beaches and find a parking spot and enjoy our island the way we should enjoy it um, has changed. And I think um, in a sense, uh, you know, what the state had tasked HTA to do, which is to market Hawaii as a premier destination and not a budget destination, um, is something that we're working towards. One, to know what we're worth, make sure that we are attracting the type of visitor that we, we want to focus on coming to Hawaii, one that's going to spend money, one that's going to be respectful and is going to want to integrate themselves into our culture and our community um, is the type of visitor we're looking at. So we are looking at, one, making sure that our business sector can remain healthy and continue to thrive but two, to also have an understanding that there is a capacity limit on this island. And quite frankly, um, we have uh, reached that capacity and have gone over at times, which is where people start getting really frustrated. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, a lot of people were getting used to the less cars on the highway and, and the beaches, as you mentioned. Uh, and this talk about, you know, uh, like you mentioned, the uh, type of tourists, maybe because now you know we got they're spending less. We want the guys who spend more. But when you look at it the other way, when we want to, you know, go other places to vacation, and you know, we're not necessarily the highest spending tourists. At least I'm not. Well, I don't know, but, man. You know, I, I'm traveling with like two black belts in shopping <laughs> in my household. So you know, I think it depends. You know what kind of traveler you are, yeah, but yeah. like I can tell you, man. Um, yeah, between Mark and Haley, they got some. <laughs> yeah, but uh, some high know, ranking we, uh, belts. Yeah, we yeah we got to uh, we just stimulating the economy of other destinations. They yeah. do a great job. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned a little bit about housing. With the median price of housing, about a million dollars. And affordable housing could be 500,000. What do you think of the term affordable housing that you always talk about? Well, the word affordable depends on what you can afford. But for the people of Hawaii, I mean, let, let's face it. I mean, more than half of our children qualify for free or reduced lunch. When you take a look at the Alice report, which is the asset, you know, asset limited income constrained, but employed. Of, you know, over 40% of our households fall, you know, in that poverty level. So what affordable means is much less than $500,000 and uh, $1 million would be absurd. Uh, the way to create affordable housing, and we've been moving along that track, is you're not going to necessarily achieve affordable housing through policy. Uh, you're going to get affordable housing by having government take an inventory on our underutilized resources and meeting the building industry halfway to lower the cost of goods sold so that we can offer a lower price to our local people. And the way that we've seen it is, one, the state and the county has a tremendous amount of real estate that goes underutilized. And many of those parcels of property are near existing infrastructure, such as water, sewer, and roads. And Dennis, you know more than anybody else is somebody who's um, been in the developing world, uh, developing housing opportunities. One way to lower the cost of goods sold is to have a government that's gonna come to the table with something um, such as land and infrastructure. And so we created Keolaula at Puoloke for our houseless community. And that was really a partnership with our governor, Dilanar, and of course our legislative delegation here to transfer that state parcel over to the county of Koi, in which turn we had contractors build um, that housing community for our houseless um, community members. Um, across the street, we have uh, another workforce housing project come up. But once again, that is on county property that had existing infrastructure. And, um, you know, I think that's going to be the model moving forward is to take a look at what properties the state and county owns 
that have existing infrastructure that are in part close to jobs and other housing, um, existing housing uh, neighborhoods and starting to partner up with developers to get some roofs over people's heads moving forward. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mentioned this a uh, few times and I'll mention it again. Uh, I think that uh, for the middle class, and you know, we get so many conditions that should be worked on because when government does quote low income housing, they waive a lot of things, they especially time, and time is money in the developing world. And they fast track and it, they can bypass other conditions on normal house for some of us. They said, no, no, you gotta be a certain shape and all that. You know, that, you know, just drives up everything. I think uh, stuff like that should be looked at too. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, I mean, the reason why, right, I never wanted to get into government. And then, of course, finally, I did get involved is because one, I, I didn't agree with government. And, um, you know, I didn't have a soft spot in my heart for politicians. So what better way to get in there and shake things up and try to make a change than to get in and work within the system. And, you know, if you ask me what's driving me, it's all of that private sector experience and kind of seeing things from a different lens to say, hey, some of these things just don't make sense. You know, why are these requirements being required? And a lot of it has good um, rational reasons why we do things, but there are a number of redundancies or a number of efficient ways that we can do things. And, you know, I think one of the things that's going to set our administration apart from others is we are one of the very few executive branches that has told our legislative branch to, hey, exercise your audit powers and start auditing our departments, right? Usually you get some resistance from the executive right. branch saying, hey, this is a witch hunt, this is all political. Right. This is the first time we made it easy and said, hey, come take a look and teach us where we can be better. Very good, very good. Uh, we just got a couple of minutes left. Uh, somebody asked me uh, about the CARES money, you know, where bulk of it went, you know, you're going to touch upon a little bit on the CARES money and how you used it? That was easy. It went out into the community as quickly as we could, as intended. You know, the challenging thing about the CARES Act money is because of our population, the only um, county that got their direct deposit check was the city and county of Honolulu. We had about a five week delay um, and that's just the, the way it happens. It funneled through the state I know the state was trying to figure it out for us. And then finally they said, here, you guys get it out into the community. So by then we had already worked with our Office of Economic Development who had set up the Koi Economic Recovery Strategy Team to come up with some very quick turnarounds to get the CARES Act money into the community as quickly as possible. So a lot of it went to um, you know, community support, with supporting um, food drives, supporting food distributions, um, making sure that um, we had money to go to the Boys and Girls Club to take care of kids um, that didn't have supervision at home when um, kids couldn't go into the classrooms. Um, you know, I'd say a bulk of it went to uh, direct community um, infusion right into the economy. Some of it went to our Rise to Work program. Um, and then uh, some of it went to basic PPE to, to keep people safe during um, COVID-19. Um, but yeah, that was the intent was to get it out to the community and that's exactly what we did very quickly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so we're running out of time. We got a closing statement. Oh, that was a fast half hour. Yeah. <laughs> No, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to Think Tech Hawaii. I want to thank uh, Dennis Isaki and everybody for, for having me on. Um, I feel very honored to, to be a part of this community, and I feel very uh, humbled to, to be able to provide some leadership and some direction for our community moving through um, some big challenges and, of course, some smaller challenges as well. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you have been watching Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Yasaki. Mahalo to Derek Kawakami and to the viewers on Think Tech Hawaii.
please log in to thinktechhawaii.com and support our hardworking crew and volunteer staff. See you again in two weeks. Aloha, mahalo, and ahoy ho. Mm-hmm.